Um, and uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, Sachin has, has um, very graciously moved a couple things around so he can hang out. And Megan and I, I think, have a little extra time after 12. So we can maybe let this run for a little. So maybe if there are questions, please um, put them in the post or maybe send a little uh, a, a flag. I think we got one from Shri. Uh, Shri, can you, uh, are you, are you on the chat still? Um, can you turn on your mic? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Shri. You had a question about um, interoperability resources and standards. Can you can you please pose your question? I think it was really mostly for Sachin. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm really interested in how the EHR is evolving and um, this administration and especially this year has seen a lot of changes with CMS announcing their interoperability um, guidelines. Um, I was just wondering in terms of collating EHR data, how does the administration's policies changing affect how you do your research and what role is interoperability playing in your research with perioperative medicine the CPT codes that you were mentioning? Uh, that's a great question. Um, my, my heart is warmed by the fact that uh, we've got the next generation of great researchers talking about interoperability already. So it's, number one, the fact that you know that term is awesome. Um, number two, the, the impact is really huge on what I'd say is non-anesthesia data. So those interoperability standards, which, which you know are called FHIR, uh, -H -I -R, um, have been around for several years. It's a better standard than we used to be there before. But this administration um, has gotten really aggressive about making hospitals be required to do it and penalizing them if they don't. So what is now happening is that patients in the real world, I can go get my entire uh, health record uh, that is part of the FHIR standard, which includes my diagnoses, which medications I'm on, my lab results, which immunizations I've had. That stuff I, you know, is actually not just theoretically available, it's actually available on your iPhone, on your Android phone, and any other FHIR compliant app. That was a few years ago, it's a reality now. We're actually using that for one of our projects. We've got about uh, 6,700 patients that we enrolled in a study uh, sponsored by Apple where We've actually integrated many of those patients' data using that FHIR standard, and those patients are sharing their health record data with us using that interoperability standard, something that was never possible. So our next step is actually do a national study where we'll understand that someone had an anesthetic. They had a lap coli on this date, and we'll be able to see where they readmitted six months later without talking to the hospital. So the really cool part is you don't have to convince the hospital to sign a legal agreement. I can recruit somebody and get the data from the patient. What's missing there is from a perioperative medicine perspective is you won't know were they hypotensive during that surgery or not because that fire standard doesn't currently include the intraoperative anesthesia record. So if your focus is the intraoperative period and the interventions there, you're probably still not where you need to be the fire standard. But I'd argue that the most impactful research we do is not just intraoperative focused only. It's about surgery, anesthesia in general, and then what is the long-term outcome. So our long-term outcome ability is much better with the current fire standard. That was a great question. Thank you, and great answer. Thank you, Sachin. Um, uh, other questions? I don't think we have any. I, I haven't seen others come in the chat, and I'm also looking in the Q and A. Um, uh, any other other quick questions that people have? I'm happy to pose a couple myself, but I'd love to hear hear what you all have to to ask. Christine Chen has a question. Uh, thank you again for your presentations. Um, I have a, um, like two questions. This is just the first one. So I just I had a question about data sharing because I think Dr. Um, Kudur, um, Paul, sorry if I'm butchering your name. Um, you mentioned that a lot of groups right now have like sort of a mon monopoly on data and people in like the AML ML community have said that there will eventually come a point where there's like a monopoly by several companies and people will just be purchasing data. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on it. Um, what is being done to kind of ensure this is not happening and like where do you see like this direction, um, it going like in a new direction in the future? I, I would, um, I'll, I can take a stab at that and I'd love to also hear Sachin and, and Megan weigh in. You know, um, 
I think one of the things that has been really uh, wonderful about working in the anesthesia community is the level of collaboration that goes on. Um, you know, the nature of medical data in the United States is it's very decentralized, right, in terms of what's in the hospital record. Uh, each hospital kind of governs its own data policies and things like that. And, and in, in some ways, it's actually set up to prevent collaboration and sharing. Um, so when we come together in collaborative efforts, uh, it really takes everybody to participate. And I have to acknowledge Sachin, who um, I think has really been a leader for the specialty in this regard, in that uh, MPOG had been set up from the very, very beginning to be very collaborative, very, very transparent, and, and really avoid that uh, monopolizing. And, and I learned a lot from that, and I think it's been a great model. I think that there is a potential risk for um, EHR type data to be somewhat monopolized in a different way that's, that's sort of governed by people outside of the specialty, which is by those organizations that uh, control EMR systems and hold that data and can purchase that data. That's stuff that in, in many ways, at least for me as an individual investigator, I can only speak to through advocacy. Sachin may have a closer seat at the table to actually influence those conversations, but those are, those are real concerns. But as far as the research data interactions go, um, it's really about uh, collaboration and, and coordination, I found. I don't know, Sachin or Megan, if you guys would like to nuance that or, or add other comments. Yes, I, I would just add that I think this is, um, it's, it's a little bit tangential to the question that was asked, but I think it's really important to remember that the um, data that's generated, the clinical data, uh, you know, is often, and I, I would say increasingly we're seeing sort of um, uh, owned or administrated by a health system. And so I think physician leadership in maintaining that relationship between the academic missions of your um, you know, department or your hospital and the people who are making decisions about structuring the data or access to the data is really important. So I would say staying involved, honestly, to make sure that your um, department research group has access to the data within your system is probably as much or more of a concern uh, as I see it than worrying about sort of a national entity getting a monopoly over you know, that it's there and getting access to it are two really different things. And I think um, leadership is really important um, on the part of academic physicians to maintain that. That's a great point. That's a great point. All politics is local, right? So. Sachin, I don't know if you could comment a little bit. Yeah, you know, I'd say we're probably um, in the post uh, monopoly stage for EHR data at this point. Um, uh, I think five years ago, healthcare systems were trying to hoard their own data and, and stuff like that. And uh, I think through, um, you know, leadership and advocacy by physician researchers, by nursing researchers, and by policy, you know, we, we've broken through that mold, I think, not just as especially, but as an industry. So hospitals at this point really can't hoard their data as effectively as they could a couple years ago because the patient has access via the fire standard. Um, I think the part that we should be concerned about is, the consumer level data. So that watch that you have on, the Fitbit that you're wearing, uh, other data types that are out there, those are I think in the middle of the monopoly stage <laughs> where you know getting Google and who you know is trying to buy Fitbit and Apple to collaborate on a project is not easy. I've, I've tried. <laughs> um, I, but once again, I think it's the consumer that will be our nidus of action. I think five years ago, 10 years ago, we really focused on healthcare systems as the bad actors. And at this point, it's not that they became good, it's just that legislation and reality bit them in the butt, and so they've had no choice but to share. And I think now we're gonna deal with uh, consumer data stream industries dealing with the same thing, which is uh, they're gonna fight tooth and nail to make their data their unique differentiation. And once again, legislation and focusing on the, the constituent, which is the, the patient, getting the data from them. So we've shifted our strategy from focusing on CIOs and CEOs of hospitals to how do we get the patient to believe in the value of sharing their data because that's the long-term strategy. And in that context, I'm not super worried about monopoly because I think the, the patient is gonna win in that one. A great question. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, and I, I too, as Sachin mentioned before, I too am cheered by the future 
uh, prospects for anesthesia research that people are thinking in these directions. Um, other questions, it's already noon. Um, it's, it's optional, of course, for people to stick around if they wish. The panelists have volunteered to stay for a few more minutes if there are any other questions. Um, anybody else? Let me check the Q&A and see if anything else came up. Anything else in the chat or that something, anything people would like to spontaneously bring up? Mm. This is Shri. I just had one more question for Dr. Ketterpal. Go ahead. Um, in your opinion, what are the main sources of innovation that are yet to happen in EHR delivery, at least in terms of the consumer level? You're saying that patients have their data, but um, not that many patients that I know, or at least like the people around me that I've asked, not that many people know that that's a thing. And there's a lot of hurdles to get that data. So I was just like thinking about innovation in the EHR space. What are some points of innovation that you see are going to happen in the next few years? Uh, so, I mean, I, I do think uh, patient engagement in their EHR is an important concept. Um, as we've now seen with COVID, uh, the concept of virtual visits has gone from being the nearly fringe concept to being the way we deliver care. And what it's going to do is accelerate um, the uh, distribution and in, in, in of healthcare itself. You know, we've got a completely different model for how we take care of uh, moms uh, in their nine months of pregnancy now at U of M. We're like, wait, you actually are going to bring a mom in, expose her to a potential mom to a COVID laden clinic to like listen to the baby, check her blood pressure, and send her home? That's the stupidest thing we've ever heard of. Oh, wait, it's what we've done for the last 50 years, though. Um, and so I think the, the next set of innovation is really about. Uh, engaging the patients and their daily experience in health. Not every six months when you go visit your doctor, that's probably unnecessary anyway, but how are you feeling every day and getting that information into the provider's decision-making? The way my dad feels every day is far more important than the one blood pressure they check once a year. And I think that's our opportunity, not just in medicine in general, but also as anesthesiologists. So when we say, how you feeling today? Does it really matter the morning of it? What matters is how they feel for the last month and how they're going to feel for the six months after their surgery. That long-term interaction, which, you know, um, Mark is doing great work with Decori, Megan's quality metrics are focused on that, which is really getting the patient's data and daily life experience into our decision-making is the next great innovation. And COVID's going to help, unfortunately. It's, it's horrible, evil, disgusting thing in many ways, but it might actually accelerate that because we have to go through digital tools now. I have one last question here. I'm going to let Christine uh, Christine have the mic uh, for the final final question. Um, Christine, can you can you uh, read out the question you posed? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So um, it's more like a two part question, but um, I'm curious that like currently ML and AI have really focused on things like imaging, pathology, radiology. There's a couple startups that are currently being developed in Boston and around the country. So I'm just wondering, what are some new directions and fields for ML AI research that you see on the horizon given the current limits, such as like IBM's Watson, you mentioned that the trial done at MD Anderson wasn't successful. So I'm just thinking, what are your thoughts there? And do you think, um, because there's currently in talk in the AI ML community of this like AI ML winter where there is no sort of breakthrough that um, similar to what happened a couple years ago by like um, people like Andrew and of Stanford that allowed the field to push a lot faster. Um, do you think another sort of breakthrough is needed in order to more effectively apply these techniques to healthcare or do you think the bottleneck is somewhere else? I'll, I'll take a stab at that first if, if I might and, and I do think that there's a breakthrough that's needed uh, but I would argue as somebody who's somebody on the who's somewhat on the sidelines of the MLAI discussion is that, um, you know, I think in medicine, we still have really important evidence gaps in terms of knowing what works. And I think that uh, developing efficient algorithms for ML and AI in terms of prediction are useful for prognostication, perhaps. And that's one important, very, very important role. But even with that, prognosticating important patient-centered outcomes, things that matter to patients, that relies on better data and data that may not be automatically accessible in EHRs, as Sachin mentioned, but then also knowing what to do to impact those outcomes. 
And I think we have gigantic glaring evidence gaps in terms of how to practice, uh, in terms of what things may be effective interventions to improve outcomes. And that's a space where things like pragmatic trials and high quality comparative effectiveness studies come in that look at outcomes that matter to patients. So I think the tools of AI in some ways require a context where we have data that's meaningful and also uh, resources to actually change care, change practice and, and, and the knowledge to do that. So I think there are breakthroughs needed. Um, I can't speak to the breakthroughs that may be required on the AI side purely, but I actually think that the breakthroughs that are needed to make AI good are breakthroughs like figuring out how to capture data that manage, matter to patients and figuring out how to do things like pragmatic RCTs efficiently and quickly so that we can actually make better decisions. So that's my, that's my clinical trial as clinical epidemiologist take. Uh, and uh, as someone who's not part of the AI ML family, but a, a stander on the sidelines, I don't know if Sachin or Megan can, uh, can, can offer a perspective as well. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest, um, I hang out with engineers a lot these days, um, and it's pretty clear that what we don't need is more graphical processing units or more CPUs to make healthcare safer. We've, we've got enough computing power, we have enough algorithms, and we have enough engineers trying and companies trying to do it. Uh, the, the innovation is actually in um, restraint and choosing the right problems. Uh, I, I think to Mark's point, you know, uh, you know, we've got lots of problems that need to be solved. We're not picking the right problems. We happen to have a tool. If somebody had a, a PhD in image analysis, everything's image analysis now, whether or not it's helpful, you know. So I think we really need to get the doctors, the nurses, the policymakers, the patients, and the engineers together. So the innovation actually is in building the right teams so that they address the right questions. And the rule we have within our AI ML group is essentially don't, don't help me with prediction, help me with action. So if we have an effector arm, a perfect example is readmissions. If we actually have a better um, solution to preventing readmissions, once you figure out someone's a high risk for readmission, then I'll go solve that problem. But taking your you know, C statistic from 0.78 to 0.84, I don't give a damn. You know, and, and increasing the literature doesn't either. Uh, we're kind of like, in, for the most part, unless you've got thousands of features or millions of features, ML doesn't do any better than a logistic regression. Um, and, in, and it just distracts people. So we only use ML for things that are unsolvable via classic techniques. And if you actually do a better prediction, you have a validated treatment for the result of that prediction. Telling someone they're gonna die for sure is marginally helpful in improving the healthcare system. We've had tools to do that for a long time we ignore them all. Um, we've had Apache scores in the ICU for 20 years. This person has a 99.9% .9 likelihood of dying. Okay, we put them on a vent, you know. So it's not about prediction, it's about action. So it's about picking the right problems. This was an awesome conversation. I'm so glad everybody joined. I really want to thank Megan and Sachin for, for, for participating and sticking around uh, after as well. Um, I wanna thank Sri and Christine uh, for their questions, as well as everybody who participated. Um, I'd like to thank Olivia Stevens for organizing this. You did a great job and, uh, and I think uh, really made this seamless. And in, in absentia, I'll thank Harriet for her leadership and making uh, MSAR for reality in spite of COVID uh, in, in, in imposed constraints. Um, thank you, everybody. I, I hope you continue to have a great experience in the MSARF. I think I speak for all the panelists, I hope, when I say you can always reach out to us if you have questions. We are all uh, thrilled to engage and, um, you know, love to see anesthesia uh, growing and expanding. So please uh, keep in touch and let us know how we can help you.